Hi everyone, Dan Gunner from Insane Forensics. Welcome back to Tech Talk Tuesday, where every week we try to give something to help your threat hunting and security program. And today what we're going to dive into is run key persistence and how you can discover it during a threat hunt. So first question, what is run key persistence, right? There's actually a MITRE attack technique that fall or that this falls under T1060. And really this MITRE attack technique falls into two parts. So there's creation of run keys in the registry um, or dropping files in startup folders. Um, and with this, this is ways that attackers can either, you know, get persistence at start. Sometimes it's used for privilege escalations. It really depends on what they're doing. But the kind of summary of T1060 is using the registry and using the fact that, hey, some parts of the operating system or some parts of applications use value in the registry to run things. Um, this is what you know registry persistence captures at the end of the day. It's used by just about everyone. So if you go to the MITRE attack page and or you go look at case studies, this is a technique you'll see quite a lot. So some companies actually put this as one of the most common techniques used. Um, so today, this is a great thing to learn about and great thing to add to your threat hunts um, because it's used quite a bit by just about everyone. So how do these run keys work? So within the Windows registry, this is a officially documented. So this isn't one of the attacks where it's using kind of an undocumented or non-common feature. In the Windows registries, um, there's four primary locations for these, and there's run and run once keys. So run keys run every time the user logs in or every time the system starts. Run once keys will run one time, um, then they're generally deleted after. Um, the four primary locations you see are there. These locations are very important to note because this is what you'll see a lot of times when you see a piece of malware using this writing in. If you were to go into a sandbox, you would look for, hey, do I see this malware sample writing to that software Microsoft Windows current run, version run um, path? If they're writing there, then they're pulling this technique off. It's as simple as that. But what's interesting also with run once keys is to note that there are some options that you might see on there. So if you prepend an exclamation mark to the front of the run once key, um, it's going to delete the key after execution. The standard behavior of it is actually to delete the key right before it executes. Um, so this leaves the key around a little longer. Why they do this, why it's waiting for after, is if that key runs and the program fails, the key's not there, to where prepending the um, exclamation mark to the front of it, letting it run, waiting for that successful, or for the success code at the end, this will guarantee that the program you know, successfully completes. The other notation thing that's important to note on run once keys um, is the uh, character you see there, right? The, uh, um, the asterisk, sorry, my brain was going there. So putting the asterisk there um, will actually force it to run in safe mode. So generally run once keys won't run in safe mode. If you add the asterisk there, it's going to run it in safe mode. So just because it's safe mode doesn't mean you can also use this to execute. Um, if you're, you know, if you have an attacker that's trying to hit you in safe mode, you know, this is definitely something to note. It also might note that the attacker actually looked at the documentation and knows this is possible with run once keys, um, because this isn't very common for a lot of people to know about there, but it's important for you as a threat hunter or as a blue teamer to understand, hey, if I'm seeing this, then they're also trying to get this to run in safe mode. So some examples, we talked about the theory, let's talk about how people are actually using it. So APT37 back in May 2017, they did this big spear phishing campaign, um, pretty classic, let's use uh, Microsoft Office docs with scripts in them with HT or with, uh, you know, malicious HTA scripts. Um, this was CV2017-0199, which is a CV you see a lot with spear phishing. Um, and what they did is as part of the script, they created one of those run keys um, to basically load uh, next stage of malware survey. It was called Frinky. Um, there's a whole Talos report if you wanna read more there. But again, this shows a very example or a very simple example from the Microsoft Office document from the phishing document. 
Um, attackers are using run keys as early as this. Another one hitting the industrial community. So this technique is also used against industrial targets. Dragonfly actually was a very, very big campaign to where uh, the people, the attacker behind this actually targeted government, industrial, commercial, whole bunch of groups were targeted since at least 2016 with this. Um, Dragonfly has a multi-stage down, uh, downloader that writes files to disk. One of the things that this downloader does is create a registry key called NTDLL, right? Try to blend in, it's a little bit of masquerading here. Um, but they write a registry key to, again, the current version run folder, um, persisting NTDLL, the malware that they drop into that, right? And you know, I think after this one, they pull another loader in. But again, you have a case to where you have malware loaders that are using this persistence technique. And in this case, it was used, like I said, against a whole ton of targets in 2016. So again, very popular technique. It's a technique that still works, um, and that's why it's still used. Last example we'll use here, so it's not just about kind of the run, um, run folders you have there. Here you have APT41. Um, they use Cobalt Strike Beacon for calling out actually a trial version of Beacon. And what they did is they tried to, or they did, they put it under the service host registry key. And this basically, um, this is part of creating malicious services, right? So they created this registry key, pointed it to the trial version of Cobalt Strike, and then they used the expected built-in Windows command to kick this off, right? When you're talking about um, creating keys that run from registry, it's not just the run once keys we talked in the last two slides. This is an example to where, you know, service host, another part of Windows, if you know where to write and if you know the command to run, you can kick, up, kick off something like Cobalt Strike. You'll also see this with applications. We're not going to show an application example today, but what you might see with some applications is they do the same thing, right? When this script starts, they might say, okay, when this application starts, we wanna kick off this script. Well, what's the location of that script? Okay, let me go into the Windows registry and pull out the location of that script. And they might use the registry as a database. So when they put an update, right, they can say, instead of run a.bat, run b.bat instead. So, you know, this behavior, it isn't just always the operating system. Sometimes you'll see this with uh, application values in um, in the Windows registry. And it's still run key, right? Because it's not like with the first examples we showed, those happen when the user logs in. In this case, you can kind of hook it off of application behavior if the application's using a run key here. So how is this relevant to threat hunting and how do we add it to our threat hunting? A uh, few places we can look, right? So first of all, check the known popular registry locations. If you're bringing host data into a threat hunt or you have live hosts, you should definitely be enumerating these registry keys to see, hey, what's written in here? What's expected to be written in here? What's anomalous? Understanding what's at those known popular registry locations because the fact is attackers are still using it because people don't look there. Or, you know, it's, you know, the run once key to where, you know, people don't have enough visibility to maybe see that run once there. Um, your Windows event logs, right? And particularly if you have Sysmon, um, Sysmon can monitor some of the registry rights, right? Um, so Windows event logs, another good one. If you have things like OS query and other dynamic or static um, analysis tools, you can also do that, right? So with OS query, you can say, hey, let me look right at, you know, let me look for registry rights. Let me look for certain behaviors on the box. Um, you don't just have to look in host data for this. So there's the uh, remote registry write protocol. You can actually call it over the network. Um, you want to look in network traffic for people writing to these registry keys also because they don't have to be on the box if remote registry service on Windows is enabled. Um, your EDR, your endpoint detection, and your net network detection um, might have signatures to look for this, both on the Windows and host side, right? And like I said, the other one with static and dynamic malware analysis, if you're working with samples or you're looking at virus total or hybrid analysis, looking for registry rights or, or rights to this part of the registry associated with 
known run keys or known applications that are launching these. This is something you can do, um, you know, and you can do this with sandbox execution. Doesn't have to be out to the cloud. It could be if you have Cuckoo Sandbox or, you know, if you have your own version, uh, self-hosted version of Falcon or something else, um, you can definitely look in sandboxes for this behavior also. So again, what we talked about today was run key persistence. We talked about it on the operating system level. We talked about it a little bit with service hosts. Um, and then we also talked about it on the application level. We talked about how you can hunt for it and things to look for. Um, so thanks for joining in this week. We hope to see you back next week.